Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, my name is Adam Fraser. I'm a solutions architect with Zyverge, which is generously sponsoring this event, as well as a core contributor, Zio. And today I am very excited to introduce Dov Samet. Dov is a uh, engineering manager at LinkedIn and is the author of Scala PB, which is, is billed as a Scala protocol buffer library, but I think is really the Scala protocol buffer <laughs> library. And if I'm, I can recall, if I LinkedIn, if Twitter has not been lying to me, I think just passed a thousand stars on GitHub, which is pretty amazing. So congratulations on that. And today he's here to talk to us about ZOG uh, RPC, which is a new library for building microservices with gRPC in a way that interfaces with modern functional effects systems like Zio and gives us type errors and the environment and layers and interruption and all of that good stuff. So with that, let me turn it over to him. Thanks, Adam. Hey, hi, everyone. Hey, my name is Nadav Samet, and I'm an engineering manager at LinkedIn. And as Adam said, I'm also the author of a library called Scala PB, which makes it fun and easy to use the protocol buffers in Scala. At LinkedIn, I'm working on the messaging platform. So what I want to talk to you about today is a new library called ZOGRPC, which makes it easy to rapidly build production-ready type-safe microservices using Zio and GRPC. Our agenda for today, uh, we are gonna talk about microservices in general and how you set them up and why they're useful and how do you gonna get to talk, how are you gonna get them to talk to each other? Uh, and I'd recommend that you use something like GRPC and why you should avoid using JSON. Uh, we're then uh, gonna look into the solutions that are available for Java and Scala for building microservices with GRPC and justify why we need a new solution that is based on Zio and what advantages we are getting by building our new solution on Zio. And lastly, it's gonna be the fun part of the, everything's gonna be fun, but the last part is gonna be the most fun when we are gonna do a, a live presentation, a live coding of a, an example application that is built with Zio and GRPC. So let's start. So when we talk about the microservice architecture, we're talking about dividing your big application into a number of smaller components, each responsible to do one thing, and it does that one thing really well. So for example, you might have a front end that is uh, talking to uh, other microservices. So in this example, we see a user profile microservice and a billing microservice and a reporting microservice. And each microservice is a separate program as its own ownership of some storage and, um, and other properties. And it's potentially managed by a different team. What are the advantages of this architecture? Why do we wanna, when and why do we wanna structure things this way? So there are a lot of advantages and just to name a few, uh, you can uh, deploy every microservice independently. So in a monolithic app, when you have a, a one line change, you have to redeploy the entire system. When you are working in a microservices environment, you can deploy each microservices separately and uh, leave the rest of the system intact. So as a result, you can deploy faster and changes make it to users uh, sooner. And there is, in addition to that, you have those teams that are built around the microservices and they have an increased sense of uh, uh, ownership and increased autonomy to make changes and release their the, uh, the piece. In addition, this uh, configuration allows you to write different services using different technologies. And while it's true that you want to have some standard standards in a company and select a few technologies and that you understand and support really well, sometimes certain problems can be solved in a, by a certain tool much better. And using microservices lets you to experiment and replace one component with a different implementation and find the right tool for, for each job. And lastly, there's the issue of scaling and resilience. When you have a distributed uh, system, a failure of a single microservice can be scoped to that and it doesn't necessarily become a total failure of the system and your users might see only degraded experience. So failures can be isolated. 
In addition, if your system needs scaling, in a monolithic system, you have to scale the entire system as one piece. But when you have microservices, you only need to scale the parts of the system that need to be scaled. The next question then, when you have uh, microservices, is how you get them to talk to each other. And I divided the, the set of protocols to three families. First, you have the ad hoc protocols. Those that are uh, invented as you go. So typically JSON over HTTP is like that. Uh, people set up a web server and then there's a, a bunch of URLs and they expect some JSON and you write a document that if you post this JSON body to that endpoint, there's that response that comes in um, and uh, it, it does something. And historically, it's kind of interesting to see, but back in the 90s and early 2000s when JSON and HTTP were not that popular, uh, people would write TCP servers and they would have like byte by byte protocol that they would parse and serialize. Typically, uh, with a JSON over HTTP, HTTP also called uh, often as REST, there is no machine readable schema. There, is, there are ways to do that, but typ in typical applications, it is a, there is a human a, a written document is a, meant to be read by another human. Uh, the other family of protocols is the message-based protocols. Over there, there are things like gRPC, Threat, and Twilt, and in those systems, uh, you're defining a formal API contract. There is an actual file that says, here is a service, and here are the methods that it contains, and here are the fields that they have, and what the types are, and what's optional, and what's required, and so on. It's machine-readable. And as a consequence of that being machine-readable, you can automatically generate clients for these services for many languages and platforms. And finally, there is GraphQL, which sits in its own uh, category. Uh, GraphQL is designed for querying and mutating data. And uh, you define a schema for your data, that, and uh, then clients can set, make requests to, to fetch that data in a, in a very sophisticated way and to uh, mutate it. Generally, I think that GraphQL doesn't compete directly with the other two types. In a typical application, it would set up as an in the external layer uh, letting uh, users make requests that get translated by the GraphQL server to a lot of downstream requests to the, to the microservices. And then the GraphQL server would aggregate the responses and return something uh, back to the user. But the communication between the GraphQL server and the downstream services is still typically done by a protocol from the first two families. We're seeing a lot of JSON over HTTP, which is called REST. So I want to point out the pros and cons of a protocol like this. So first, it's ubiquitous. If you sample a random API on the internet, it's very likely that it's going to be JSON over HTTP. It's easy to understand because it's very common. And every, virtually every language that you're using would have a great HTTP client library. It would have great JSON support. And there is great tooling. There are a lot of ways to make JSON requests. In the browser, it's easy to inspect and, and to make changes. And overall, it's easy to get started and it, and it is easy to stay there. However, there are a lot of problems. First, there is no machine-readable API contract, typically. And as a result of not having a machine-readable API contract, when you see a JSON service, you don't know what's available for you. And if you want someone to use the service, the service, they need to figure out, uh, they need to pick an HTTP client and to start to build those JSON objects and send them. And they end up writing those custom libraries in each and every language that the, the service is going to be used from. In addition, JSON doesn't support advanced features because it's based on HTTP. Because H, JSON, over, JSON over HTTP is, is based on the HTTP protocol. There's no streaming, there's no cancellations, uh, retries or timeouts. Cancellations, it's a way for client to say, I to tell the server, I'm no longer interested in the response. You can abort the computation, and the server detects that and stops computing, and that uh, and therefore serving resources on the server. And finally, JSON compared to a binary format is slow. It can be 10 times slower to serialize or parse a JSON message compared to a, a similar a binary structured message. So enter gRPC as a solution to all these problems. So gRPC is a RPC framework that was initially developed at Google. It's based on protocol buffers. Uh, as a result of that, it lets us build type-safe 
API schemas. So we define exactly what our services provide and what uh, methods they have, what fields inside those methods and so on in a type safe way. It supports auto 10 languages officially and there are some uh, less official implementations. It would run everywhere on a mobile, on desktop, on a server, uh, on a tablet. It would run virtually any, any platform. And uh, because it's based on protocol buffers, it would allow schema evolution. So as you go, typically new business requirements come in and you would want to add a field or rename a field or make some changes in your schema. And because it's based on protocol buffers, it's possible to create those, to handle those situations where you have an old client speaker to a newer server. In terms of advanced features, Jocracy supports everything you'd want out of the box, streaming, there are actually three types of streaming. We can have a server streaming. We can have the client streaming data to the server. And we can have a bidirectional streaming where both the client and the server are streaming things at the same time. There are cancellations and there are deadlines, which is essentially the client saying uh, when it sends the request that the server gets one second to respond and the server does it best and cancel on its own if it cannot do that. These are the libraries that the uh, I'm aware of that they provide gRPC support for Scala and Java. First, there is gRPC Java, which is the reference official implementation. You can use it from Scala, but however, you'll be doing Scala inside, you're doing Java inside Scala, and we don't like that. Uh, then there is Scala PV gRPC, which is a part of the library that uh, I own. And this uh, solution is very bare bones. It, wrap gRPC Java in a very thin way, and uh, it would provide you an interface to your services that is based on the Scala standard library future uh, primitive. So as a result of that, it is limited by what features can do. So for example, you cannot easily compose them or uh, uh, set up cancellations. It's actually impossible to set up cancellations to this. So it leaves a lot to be desired in terms of a uh, building on the more advanced features. Then there is ACA gRPC and FS2 gRPC. The ACA gRPC is designed for the ACA, ACA actor system, and FS2 gRPC is designed for the CathFX ecosystem. Both of them are very wonder, are wonderful libraries that you should be using if you're on those specific ecosystems. And then in the past few months, I've been working on Zio gRPC, which is a library that integrates gRPC with Zio. And I'm going to show you how we, this study leverages the power of Zio to create things that are not possible with the other solutions. So why do we need a new library, a new gRPC solution for Zio? Zio as a concurrency framework offers advancements that are not available anywhere in, a, in Scala today. And Zio gRPC builds on those unique strengths of Zio to make it super easy to build high performance, type safe microservices by building on the basic building blocks that Zio provides. So it mixed really well with your rest of your Zio application. So for example, RPC calls are just functional effects. So you, when you make a call, an RPC call, you, it doesn't really happen at the point you're calling a method, you're getting back a pure value. And as a pure value, is composable and combinable, which gives you a lot of power. What does it mean that it's composable and combinable? It means, for example, that you can create two uh, RPC calls and race them to see, get them to run together to see who comes back, and uh, you get a response from the first one, and it automatically interrupts the second one. Or you can uh, take a single request and retry it until you get the result that you want. So you can easily take a, a request effect and apply transformations to it uh, in a very sophisticated way. And it makes it really easy to build complex programs that are very easy to read and easy to write. Request cancellation is just modeled for uh, fiber interrupts in Zio. So we'll see uh, how easy it is to handle a canceled request on the server in the next slide. And when you're dealing with cancellation, one thing that uh, you should be worrying about is what happens to resources you acquired. So when you acquire a resource in an RPC and it gets canceled, you want to be sure that it's, uh, that it's released to the system and you don't have a resource leak. One of the distinguishing 
features of Zio is a failure tracking. In every effect in Zio, the, the type of the failure is actually marked in, in, the, in the type of the effect. And Zio GRPC leverages that to, uh, to give the user a, a very easy way to signal RPC errors within the effect system. To deal with RPC streaming, we are using Zstream that is uh, available from ZIO, and it's, so, it's very easy to build RPCs that get streams or return streams or both, and, and I'll, I'll give a demo for that. And in addition, the dreaded problem of dependency injection is solved really nicely with ZLayer. It's very common when implementing services that they have dependencies on other services, and there's always a dilemma on how to wire this dependency graph together, and this is solved really nicely with ZLayer, and ZOGRPC lets you build on that. Just a little teaser on the situation in Java for handling cancellations. The documentations in Java tell you whenever you're implementing an RPC server and you're about to do some expensive computation in your, in your handler, you should check before it if the request got canceled so you don't do this computation for no reason. So you put this if there and you return. But what happens if you allocated the resource just before this. So you have to do something like this. You put a, you allocate the resource and you have to put this check inside the try and in the finally close, you release the resource. And let's compare the situation to what you do in ZOGRPC. In ZOGRPC, we build on the bracket primitive, which is shipped with Zio. And this bracket primitive gets an effect to acquire the resource, an effect to release the resource, and then it gets a closure, which is supposed to compute a new effect that gets that resource as a parameter. And that's all I have to do. The bracket guarantees that if there's an interaction or exception or any type of failure, the release happens here. And I don't need to worry about this. But moreover than that, I don't need to keep checking all over the place if the request has been canceled. I know that the fiber that executes the effects that we're going to have here is going to be get automatically interrupted by the framework if there is a if there's a, anything happens, and if we are concerned that those interrupts ha will happen at an inconvenient time, we still can use those effect combinators to ensure that we to, to select a certain region and ensure that that part is uninterruptible, so the interrupts can only happen uh, outside of that region, and we are guaranteed that the release will happen eventually. So this is a time to actually do a quick uh, a demo. If you know me, you know how much I like hiking and camping. So it's only natural for me to build a, an application related to that. And we're going to build any hike. Application name is going to be any hike, which is a purely functional type safe hike logging service with Zero and gRPC. So imagine that you're hiking and you're holding a mobile phone and the phone keeps talking to a service to record your location and timestamp as you go. And then when the hike is over, you can connect to the service and download the trail that you went through. And your fans on the platform can actually watch you live as you hike and, and see a live stream of, the loca of your location. It's very cool. And I'll see how we can build that in Zio in very few lines of code. So we start with the location object. Um, and this is a simple protocol buffer message that they call location, and it has three fields, the latitude and the longitude of where the user is located, and a timestamp, which represents uh, the point in time when that location has been recorded. And once you have this protocol buffer, you can use the protocol buffer compiler to generate code for it in many languages. And using Scala PB and an SPT plugin uh, that comes with it, you can generate Scala code that looks a little bit like this. You get the case class code location, it would get the latitude and longitude as, a, a, as double, the timestamp as long, and you, it will automatically generate for you two methods. Two methods. One of them is two byte array that takes, your, uh, that takes that instance and creates an array of bytes that represents the content of that message. And the opposite message would be parse from that takes an array of bytes and returns back the location. So it would look something like this. You instantiate the location, you call 
two bytes array on it, you call two vector because array of bytes don't have a nice two string method, and you, and you get uh, this sequence of bytes. And the opposite method is far strong. Uh, you give it the, the bytes and you get back the original uh, location instance. If you're wondering what these numbers are, the one, two, three, so in protocol buffers, you have to supply a tag number, a field number for every message. And when the message gets serialized, what it serializes is actually, instead of serializing the name, it would serialize the number in the binary format. So it creates a smaller binary payload, but it also gives you the power to rename a field. And if you, if you have a client and a server and they have a different name for the same field number, they're still allowed to talk to each other and they, nothing breaks. So this is one example of how a service can evolve as you go and, uh, and make, you can make certain type of changes to it. When you work with ZeoGRPC, you don't have to worry about it, the Bible presentation. Those details are hidden from you, but it's good to know that it's there because eventually that's what ZeoGRPC does. It translates the bytes that were to the network. It sends them over the network. This is a full service definition. So this is our high store service, and it has three methods. Add locations, which takes an add location request and returns an add location response. Add location request is just a list of locations. So the user will just upload the list of the locations they've been, and they can upload again and again and again as they have. And each time they send this add location request, they'll get back an add location response, which would just be the size of the collection of locations that we build up on the server. There is another RPC method, get locations. And it gets a get location request. And for simplicity, it's just an empty message. And it would give us a get location response, which is the list of locations that we recorded. So every time we call get locations, we get back the full height from the beginning. Stream locations gets also this empty message, get location request. And it would return a stream of locations. So this request would stay open and it would give back to the user a, a stream of these location objects that represent the, the movement of the icon. So this is, a, again, in a larger font, the same uh, RPC service. And Zio GRPC has an SPT plugin that would generate for you a trait that looks like this. It would have an, a, a Scala method for each RPC that would get the request and it would return back an effect, an IO, that represents that action. Um, and for those who are not familiar with IO, there is a, the IO type takes two type parameters, E and A, um, and it represents an effect that may succeed with a value of type A or fail with a value of type E. So this is, this uh, effect can fail with the status, it's a GLPC, Status comes from the GLPC library. It's just a failure code. And it can succeed with the, the response that we want, with the add location response. And the get locations also has a similar structure. And stream locations would return a ZIO stream that can fail with the status or produce a, a sequence of locations. It can fail with a certain status at any point in time. And the stream can be potentially infinite. And there are two, two ways to view this Ike store trait. The first way to view it is a client. So if I have an instance of this Ike store and I manage to get it by connecting to something, I can call add locations on it and the effect that it would represent, nothing happens immediately, right? These are just values that are suspended effects. And so when I create this effect, it would represent the side effect of connecting to a service and, and a streaming that request, uh, sending that request to that service and getting back a response. The other view of this is that we think of the same trait as a, an implementation on the server side. So the, same, so the same trait is also used to implement the server. So we can think of a hype store server that extends this trait. And now those effects are describing what the server should do when it receives the request. What effect they should be completed on the server side to, to serve that uh, client. Uh, to make things uh, 
more general on, Z, uh, on zero, we, and we want to make it uh, more extensible. We, we have a, a more general trait called Z hike store in this case. So we always prepend the Z for the service name. And that uh, type take two param type parameters, R and context. R represent the dependencies. It could be a database that your service needs or anything that, any type that it needs access to that would represent something that your server, that your, that your effects need to do their function. And then there's the context. And the context has some fixed type, but the value changes between requests. It's every time expected to be different. So for example, it could be the headers of the request, which is some metadata. And we can use that to have some business domain objects like the, the identity of the user making the request if it's an authenticated user. And what we do here, we basically combine those two types and pass it to, through the environment. So this is basically a way of saying that the Z-Hike store is a collection of effects that need two things to run. They need uh, some dependencies and they need some, some metadata that's available from the request. Uh, so the requests that those, those, those methods return are not useful on their own. They have to have this environment provided to them to be actually executed. And the Ike store that we saw before, the simpler version, was just a, it's just a type alias to, to this one, to any, any. It's the Ike store of any, any. And when we say that the dependency is any, we mean that any object would satisfy the dependency. This is another way of saying there are no dependencies because we might as well cast the number 42 as a dependency and it will still be satisfied. So uh, this is a basic way of saying in a type set way that ignore the dependency, anything would do. Let's make an example of that. So in a typical application, you would wanna make a, you want to know who the user is that is making the call. So your server implementation would take a, would be an extension of Z-Hike store. Let's say that you don't have any dependencies. And the context is has user. The has user means that the has is a, is a, a mechanism provided by ZIO, which is essentially a map between types and value of that type. That makes it very easy to combine a, certain things into a single, to a single a, entity. It's basically a map from a type to a value. And we only care about one type or the user type as an input. So um, in this case, the add location implementation would get uh, this has user. So we know that the effect that this is computed must have a user provided in the environment to, to do its operation. And we can access that inside the, the request, do some computation with it, and return a response. Now, the question is, how do we, so when we have a service like that, how can we actually use that? Because how, how can the framework translate from the headers and the request context that uh, GRPC gives us into our domain specific user object? It's just something that we invented here. So for example, one way to do it is that we create this authentication function. This is just an example function called authenticate that takes the request context, request context coming from zero GRPC it's, a, it's, it's basically shipped with it, and it has access to the headers of the request. And it returns an effect that computes the user from the request. Why it's an effect and not just the user? Because maybe you need to go to a database or, or make some, some computation that is non-trivial, that's effectful uh, to compute the identity of the user. So here, we get the, head, the user key header from the metadata. We, get, we are looking for a certain header. And if we, defend, if we determine that it's Bob, we give a permission in I, we fail with it. If it's any other person, we let them in with a succeed, succeed username object. And otherwise, if there's no value in the header that we are looking into, we fail with an unauthenticated. And here is a, a really nice feature of COGRPC that you're taking this service, the one that you ju we just implemented here, and we call transform context M on it, M because it's effectful. There's another one that's a, that is not effectful, just pure, for pure functions. And uh, we pass the authenticate function to it. And when we do that, we basically convert our service from a ZIX store any has user to a ZIX store any has request context. And this is something that the ZIO GRPC framework can deal with because it understands. 
So if we look at what it does, this transformation that, uh, that we allow to the ZeoGFC is a unique functionality that is available in ZeoGFC. And as far as I can tell it, it's not in the ALF framework. Um, but it lets you transform a collection on effects on, uh, on a collection of methods that operate on effects and stream and apply transformation to a bunch of effects at once to compute a new service. So it has a lot of applications, right? Because you can decide that the, the way you transform your effects is that you're gonna add logging and tracing. So before or after every effect that your service is gonna do, you're gonna do the same logging operation or you create some tracing header for every, every a system trace, like a distributed system tracing. Or you want to apply a global policy, like a, you want to set the same uh, timeout for all your methods. So the, the service transformation is allowing you to apply the same effect combinator to all the effects that your services can do, which is a unique capability of this library. Okay, what I want to do next is to uh, jump into my uh, IDE and, and show you ZIO GRPC in practice. So I'm gonna share the other window. Okay. And we're gonna start with the hike service one, which is gonna be the simplest implementation of this service. I just read a few question marks for us to fill in. And this is a Z hike store that wants a clock and a console to operate. So it would assume that it has access to the system clock and to a console so it can print a few things for us. And I'm gonna make the simplest service possible for us. The simplest possible service would always succeed regardless of what the request is and it would give us a get location response, sorry, add location response. An add location response, if you remember, contains the current size of the collection. It's always going to be 70. And I'm going to, to run this. And here in a different tab, I'm going to connect to this service using a, something called GLPC URL. Okay, so I want to call the add locations. So this is the command line tool that can speak to any GRPC service. You give it the host and port and the method that you want to call and, and, and the body, the payload. And here it takes it in a JSON format that you can convert it to a portable buffer. So I call it and I get back the 17. And if I call again, get again the 17. So that's a pretty full start. Here at the bottom, there's the server main, which is a trait that the, the latest version of GRPC provides that lets you create that service with almost, I mean, the pretty close zero boilerplate here. You say what port you want, and if you even don't do that, you get some default port. And you, add, you create a list of services that you wanna expose on that port, and that's it, you get the server. So very few lines of code to, to get off the ground. Now, let's pretend that the server is actually doing something very complex to get this response. So that complex thing is gonna be printing a dot. But that's not complex enough. We wanna print a lot of dots. So we're gonna repeat this on a schedule. We're gonna pre uh, repeat this 20 times. And we're gonna not want it to finish too fast. So we are gonna make this uh, space in a 50 millisecond interval. So it's gonna print 20 dots in a, a 50 millisecond interval between each dot. And then it's gonna print done. And then do the, what we originally wanted it to give, the, uh, give that response. Uh, the star greater than is basically the uh, way you concatenate effects in zero. So let me run this now, I have to, we can get it to run the new version of the service. And now I run the same request again. And we printed all the dots and done. But now I'm gonna do something a little bit different. I'm gonna make that request again. and put some spaces here. And I'm gonna abort it uh, really quickly before those two seconds are passed and we'll see what happens. You see that it just stopped in the middle. It didn't print the entire 20. So what happened here? 
when I aborted GL to CVRL just before I, it was aborted and the connection was interrupted, it managed to send a signal to, uh, to the server. And the server, the ZIO GRPC framework, uh, picks that up. It would also pick it up if the, if the socket was uh, terminated. And it aborts the fiber uh, that is uh, computing the, that effect. And it's interesting to note that the point that it got interrupted, it has nothing to do with ZIO GRPC. It was just doing this at that time. So it was just going through some other effects that have nothing to do with GRPC and it managed to avoid that. So here's the difference we talked about before where you don't need to worry about cancellations explicitly in your code, it, it, especially in code that is outside of uh, the GRPC concerns. And uh, this is kind of the type of integration that you get when you're uh, writing the entire application using ZO effects. Now, Sometimes we do want to handle the interrupts and the cancellations. So here's, we're going to show that the bracket example. So we want to acquire some resource using bracket. And let's say that, you know, we don't have any example here. So we're going to uh, just acquire the number 42. So that's going to always succeed. And there, there's nothing to be really released, but to, to, to have something that happens here, we say, call it release. So we know that this release effect is the brand. Here we're going to get that actual number to compute something based on it here. Actually getting the, the resources and input so it gets the function. So I'm going to run this now. I'm going to run it like that. And I'm aborting it. And I see that even that I aborted it, zero kicked in and uh, release the resource. So I get this resource safety for free, no matter what happens inside, no matter what termination happens or cancellations or exceptions, there is a guaranteed uh, release for the resource. Cool, so that was our first example. And we're gonna move to the, we actually wanna get this service to remember the locations of being afforded. So here I have a hive service too. And this time the service needs to maintain state. It needs to remember the locations that the, uh, that the hiker is traveling. So to accomplish that, we are passing through the constructor a, a ref of list of location. Ref represents a mutable reference to a, to a list. And it provides us capabilities to mutate the reference in an effectual way that is a, that guarantee atomicity. So we don't have to worry about a concurrent updates that can a, a case, cause data corruption. So how do we do add locations? We are essentially calling the update operation on, the, on that reference, which gives us an opportunity to pass a function that would update that reference. So what that app function does, it gets the existing value, and then it takes the value from the request and concatenates that to, existing, to the existing value to compute a new value. And the next effect that it does, it obtains that value from the reference and returns the size of it to the user. And of course, if you're following closely, there is a possibility of another ha update happening in between, so we're getting a larger size here, but that's fine. We don't care to worry about it for this uh, demo. So this is main two, and I'm gonna call add locations, and I got back a one, now I'm getting a two, now I'm getting, getting back a three. And if I call get locations, I'm getting the list back. So very easy. And the next thing I want to show you is how we stream locations to get it more um, engaging. And we'll start with a, a bit of a show off of uh, the streaming API. So here what we do is uh, we're using, instead of using the value that we get the add location, we're doing some, we're gonna do a random walk. So for that, uh, the, ser the service is, uh, we're gonna use a zstream function called unfoldm which gets some initial state to be some location and a function to compute the next state and the next location based on the current state. So it, I know it sounds a little bit confusing because our location of the state are gonna be the same thing here. So it actually simplifies. So the next location uh, is a function of the current location and this function effectively computes the next location and it wraps it in an option. Because if we, as long as we return some value, 
it will continue computing, but if you want to stop the, the computation, we return none. We never do that, so we get an infinite stream, and we um, uh, draw a number uh, between minus 10 and 10, the top one is uh, exclusive, so it, it actually ends up being between minus 10 and 10, and we take the, loca the current location and we add that delta to it and increment the time stand by one, and this becomes our next state. So let's run this. And now I call the stream location API. And we get this random walk. You see how the numbers keep randomly changing, the timestamp keeps increasing. So this is just an example of how easy it is to, to build more advanced functionality on, a, on top of a, those primitives that are provided. And it was like a way to combine, right? I can call take five and only take the first five elements from the stream uh, and then uh, concatenate with another stream. That fail with the status, let's pick some random status that GAO has, like the data loss. Now when I run it, it would, it would uh, start going from a, this stream will take five elements and then it will continue from that point on to the other stream. There it is, the first five elements and the data loss. So it's very easy to build things and, and, uh, and intertwine stream and merge them in, in, in interesting ways. The, uh, the next example, which is actually what we wanna do is to get the user hike to stream, but not just a random walk. Builds on the more advanced features of the uh, ZIO streams. And the best way to understand how it's done is actually to look at the, at the constructor. So what happens here is uh, as follows. We start um, with um, creating a, a queue. And we're going to push to that queue. Every time there is a, there is a the new locations that are being sent to the server, we're gonna push them into the queue. And there's gonna be a stream that is pulling from that queue, which we call the main stream. So every time the user is uploading a new location, they are going to be available to be pulled from that mainstream. Now we're using a, a, a more sophisticated primitive that the existing providers called broadcast dynamic. Now broadcast dynamic is a, is a function that gives us back an effect that, and when we run that effect, it creates a new stream that is subscribed to the original stream. Again, so that it can be a little bit uh, confusing. Broadcast dynamic gives us a new effect. And when that effect gets executed, it would give us a new stream that is subscribed to the original one, to the main stream. And that's exactly what we want. The number thousand here represents the maximum lag that you can have between the driver that runs this operation and the slowest uh, stream. So obviously this can be a limitation in a real system, and, uh, but in a real system you probably use something like Kafka or other solutions. And we still have here the, um, the location reference that, uh, uh, that mutable uh, reference to a list of locations uh, that we're gonna use to, uh, to build up the whole stream. And you notice here that uh, our service now becomes a U-manage. And the reason that we need to, U-manage is a way to basically say that the resource, Hike Service 4, uh, has some life cycle. We need to acquire a few things before we can use it and we need to return them when we are done. And in this case, this is caused by the broadcast dynamic, which returns, runs a, a side fiber to actually uh, manage all the subscription and, and the distribution of port. Um, and service list that we saw before is support to, supports adding uh, the managed services and it all works really nicely. There's no significant difference in the code that we do to, to get it going. So how do we implement Hike Service Call? Super easy. We are updating the location reference like before, we put, and we push to the queue. So we remember when we push to the queue, it gets pushed to the stream. Um, and get location works as before. And to get the stream, so if we have a, a fan of that hiker that wants to connect and follow the, the hike, 
the effect of building that new stream is just calling this subscription function that we got before. We pass it as a contractor parameter. So we just return this effect. This is an effect that returns a stream, so we need to call stream.unwrap. Unwrap is a function that creates a stream produced from an effect. It's exactly uh, doing what we need here to run that effect and return it as a stream. So let's watch that. I'm gonna run main four. I'm gonna split it three way and I'm gonna create stream locations here. And, and now I'm gonna call add locations. And you see on the right side that every time I call, this gets a, it picks up a, the new data. The last part of the demo uh, is I think something that has not been done before, uh, is to write, so if you, if you know uh, Zio uh, can support Scala.js, so you can write a Zio code and run it inside the browser. And Zio GRPC also has Scala.js support, so you can write uh, to the clients, uh, Z, uh, Zio GRPC clients in Scala and run them inside the browser. So we're actually gonna build a, a web page that, is, that gets connected to the service. And so imagine that there's a, a web page that shows a map and you can, using the mouse, you can trace the location in the map where the user is going and that will become an ad request. And at the same time, you, you, we can also stream and see the, where the user is going. And here is how I did, I'm gonna go, go through this uh, briefly. So in everything that happens on the, connect on the page is modeled by those interaction events. The mouse can just move, or we have this filter that represents this interaction event. The mouse can move, the mouse button can be released or can be clicked. And we have those like mouse events. And as a response to those events, we can be in the idle state, we have this state filtrate, and we can be either idle or in progress. So when we're in progress, we are, it means we're clicking and moving the mouse, and we're building a list of locations in that state. And we are, when it's complete, we, are, we have this complete list of location and we're uploading it to the server. I define as a, a mark event that basically gets a location and a color, and it, it's a functional effect for creating a rectangle on the, on the browser. And here's the actual program. The, the first thing that this program does is starting a client, and it calls stream location. And for each element that come from the string, from the stream, it marks a, it as red on the map. And now we need to fault this effect but otherwise it's not gonna continue to the rest of the program. The next thing we do is we create a queue for the interaction events. And now we are saying that every time there's the on mouse down and mouse up and mouse move, every time those events happen in the page, we're gonna push the corresponding uh, interaction events into this queue. And now all these interaction events become a zero stream processing problem. So we can consume from that stream and fold over the value. So we start with the idle state and continuously process, build the state as interaction events come in. So when the user clicks the button, we create a, we find the location, we mark it as stream, and we move to in progress with that single location. And if we're in progress and the mouse keeps moving, we build more locations. And when the mouse button is released, we make a service request uh, to upload those locations and we go back to the idle state. So and that's it, here we connect the client as a layer, we build the client as a layer and then provide it for application, that's all there is to it. Um, so let me run this. I'm gonna run IP service four and I'm going to uh, share the whole screen with you. go to localhost, and here is it, right? So I am can create this trail here. And when it, when it became red, we basically got a response back from the server. So if I had a, another browser page here, okay, 
everything I draw here gets streamed to the other thing because it's always subscribed. If I draw something here, it might get picked by this one. So this is essentially, I think, the first time ever someone does a, a, a complete end-to-end -end from Scala.js to the browser to the server with zero and GRPC. And so that's uh, the live coding I was planning to, to do today. And I'm going to back uh, to the last side of the presentations, and then I'm going to take uh, questions. So uh, I hope that I was able to show you that it's easy to get started. It, you can get pretty impressive functionality out of the box. Uh, you can create a client and service in minutes. Uh, and I encourage you to check it out and uh, provide feedback and uh, experiment with it and maybe build your next API using ZeroG OPC. So uh, thank you all. And uh, I'm going to uh, move to the questions. I see that there are a few questions already uh, submitted. One question was from uh, whether uh, ZeroGRPC provides server re reflection on the server side. Uh, so by server reflection, what we mean is the ability to, uh, for a client to tell uh, what services are available on, a, on the server. So the answer is yes. Let me actually show that real quick. We have the server running, and let me close one of these terminals. And we can call GRPC URL, we call list. That's the wrong one. Something I was actually planning to show if I could later find some other this, this question would ask. And I can call, call list here. And I see the list of services that, we, that they are available here. And I, I believe that the syntax to get so I might be missing something. Yeah, I probably don't remember the syntax, but there is a, the answer is yes. So it's possible to look at the, the service and all the methods and what they provide, and, and the, that's uh, provided out of the box when you're using uh, the, um, the, server, uh, the server main plate, which is a very simple, you know, it saves some border plate, but not so much. That's all it takes to bring up the service. Cool. Okay, I'm going to look into the next question. The next question, uh, we can stop manually together a JSON format, document it manually. How do you do the same kind of design for GRPC? Um, how do the same kind of design for GRPC? Um, so uh, in what I've seen in the past, uh, the GRPC is basically the, the documentation is, is in the, in the protocol buffer itself. A lot of comments and descriptions of what the services do, and of course it's possible. I'm, I assume that there are some tools that can do it. I know that there are tools for normal messages to be converted to some human readable doc, uh, but the iteration on on that and the and the design is a you see snippet of of a protocol buffer in design docs, and it would go from a Google doc to a, to a protocol buffer, you know, as you iterate. Of that time, that that it answers the question. Um, Hey Adam, is there a view for other questions or is that what is in the chat yeah, is everything? There's also a Q&A section. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think there's a question, why does unfold M require a pair? Okay, why unfold M requires what? A pair. Oh, okay. That's a good one. So um, let's look at unfold M in, in here. So 
the signature of AND for them is that it's getting, a, it starts from some initial state S, and then it gets, it gets a function that takes that S, that takes the state, and it gives you back a, a pair wrapped inside an option. And the pair is of A and S. And A is the next element for the stream, and S is the next state. So your state and the values that are producing can be of different types. It can be completely different. So you have some state that uh, there's some data, but what you are actually, uh, the state that you're actually producing is uh, some, not exactly the state, it could be something inside your state or a function of your state. Um, and it's inside an option, so you, there's a way to signal that you want to abort the stream and then put an end to, the, to that computation. And there's one more question. What HTTP client slash server are the client slash backend using under the hood? Cool. So uh, uh, GRPC in general is built over HTTP2. And this is built on top of Netty. Uh, I think that there's a way to change that. I, I never tried. But these are the underlying technologies. Okay, I think those are all the questions we have. Thank you so much for an amazing presentation of uh, some amazing technology. Thank you, Adam. And I want to thank uh, you for hosting it and uh, Sandra for organizing and John for uh, uh, working through the initial drafts with me.